Logan Motashmi, Senior Loan Officer at AMC Lending, Contributor to Housing Wire, Housing Blogger. Welcome to Real Vision. My pleasure to be here. We, we've been trying to connect now for years, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're in Southern California, I'm here in New York, and now through the uh, magic of virtualization and social isolation, here we are connected, having this remote interview. You've been writing um, about the mortgage market meltdown. Where are we right now? How did we get here? What's going on? Well, we're kind of still in the chaotic stage right now. Um, you know, I, when March 9th came in and the 10-year yield got down to about 32 basis points and mortgage rates fell with it, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is uh, early payoff uh, uh, risk, which means that uh, refinances would accelerate. Uh, it would cost the industry a lot of money because, you know, if you're providing, a good example is if you're giving $10,000 to give somebody an interest rate, you need to keep that loan on the books for at least 18 months to, to break even or make money. And basically all the loans in 2019 and even 2020 were at risk of having an early payoff. And that, you know, is a financial burden. Then, you know, the, the mortgage rates were moving so much that you had margin call risk. And these are things that aren't really familiar to the general public. So you had two hits right now on the mortgage side of the equation. And then, as always, whenever a recession is here, and as March 12th, you can see that was the last day we had good uh, jobless claims data. So credit tightens up as well. So you're getting hit on multiple sides. And just to add another layer, the fourth one is that the servicers are going to be at risk because of the forbearance. You know, the forbearance was open to the to the public in general, and they don't really have enough capital to uh, to take that money that much uh, uh, um, payment that they have to give to the bondholders on top of that so you have four significant factors all coming into the mortgage market in a matter of weeks and this is why we see this credit stress this is why mortgage rates went up uh, you know that first week of March 9th you know rates actually went up one percent uh, that entire those five days so there's just a lot of stress right now in the mortgage market and some of these things are going to be with us. Uh, even if the economy recovers in Q4 and people go out and, you know, uh, can walk the earth again, I still think the the, the credit tightening is going to be here for a while. Yeah, that you you paid you paint a kind of bleak picture. So let's let's walk through those one at a time and just explain a little bit about what the context is and why it matters so much. Well, first of all, the non-QM side, non-QM uh, loans are basically loans that aren't a guaranteed uh, by the government. So they're a little bit out of the box. Now, they're nothing like what we saw during the housing bubble. These aren't uh, 80, 10, 10 option arm loans, loans that are going to recast uh, on you and create a, for, a foreclosure. Uh, these are just a little bit out of the box in terms of bank statement loans. Those kind of things, especially in the jumbo market, are gone for the most part. It's very little. I think that market gets hit. Uh, FHA lending, which, you know, below 620, which isn't that big either. Uh, the credit standards have uh, have gone up, so that market for for sh for a short time is gone. So that's where the credit tightening, which would happen in every situation when you're going to a, a recession. Uh, so I estimate about four. Logan, for just real quick for context, what's the percentage of total loans that are non-QM? I would say that this is actually what I was just about to say: uh, three point seven to four point three percent, roughly. That's that's basically the the non-QM. Uh, a loan. So it, it, it isn't a significant portion of the mortgage market. And they're really, some of these actually, some of these buyers are actually very well qualified. They just don't show income. They have to do bank statements. Some of these are what, what I call kind of a rich man's loan, but that's gone. Mm. So that portion of the demand is, 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 is going to be out for a while. So you're looking still, you know, at a 6 million uh, total home sale market, you're looking at a couple hundred thousand homes that just aren't going to be back until credit gets better and Wall Street wants to come in and, and, and support some of these markets. So that aspect is out of here. And that, that no matter what happens with the economy, until you see credit get better, this, this part of the housing sector just won't come back quickly. You know, it's interesting. You're talking about a percentage of the market that's less than 5%. But when things like this happen, there's the, these sort of swings at the margin. Does that have a potential impact to have a more significant impact on general price levels in the housing market? Well, here's the interesting aspect. The first two months of the year, not only the economic data was better, housing for the first time in this cycle was breaking out. 
So much that if we didn't have the virus, I would be writing about home price growth 8% year over year on a nominal basis is way too hot at this stage of, of the cycle. Typically, housing gets softer when the 10-year yield is above 2.62%, which is roughly 4.5% uh, mortgage rates higher. This is a little bit different. Housing has accelerated the first two months of the year, 13 year highs in existing home sales. Inventory is down year over year to the lowest level. So this notion that there's no homes to buy uh, twice in this cycle, cycle highs in demand with inventory at cycle lows. So the housing market was doing really well. But what we see now is this is not like a typical recession where demand just basically fell off because the, the economy itself, people aren't going out and looking at homes. People aren't having traditional open houses. So just like all economic data, uh, purchase application data has the ability to uh, drop 54% plus on a year over year average. The first eight weeks really of the heat months, the heat months I've talked about for many years, it's the second week of January to the first week of May. We had double digit year over year growth every week up until March 18th. That was the last one. So the last two weeks we saw negative 11% year over year and negative 24% year over year. That's not because demand has just simply fall off and the homes are too expensive. It's just simply people aren't going out and buying homes at this time. So the next 90 days, we have to look at housing data with a little bit of a grain of salt, because I think sometimes we might get overly too bearish uh, and, and inventory levels are just going to skyrocket. Delistings have fallen off. I think Redfin had, a, had an interesting data line where 148 percent year over year delisting because some of these sellers are just going to go, hey, listen, I'm just going to wait till this uh, lockdown is over before to sell my house. Where in 2006, monthly supply was already above six months. Uh, home sales were falling noticeably in 2006 on a year over year average. We we're also working from a very extreme level. Here, it's not that case. So it's going to be a little bit tricky looking at housing data for the next 90 days. To what extent is this market regionalized? And so, and do we see major differences or is this something that because there's a systemic transmission mechanism, we're seeing some level of homogeneity across the country? It's basically California, New York, hmm. and then everything else is different. Um, you know, whenever the 10 year yield increases in 2013 to 2014, we saw that happen in 2018 and 2019, it's the coastal areas that get hit. Pretty much everywhere else is the same. You know, um, it's not like we ever had a crash in demand in this uh, in, in this cycle for housing, but you definitely see that the coastal areas that are tied to mortgages, when mortgage rates get to even four and a half or 4.625, even though on a historical basis, it seems very low, those sectors get hit. Now, obviously it's not the case now, mortgage rates are lower, but it's always the coastal area, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, uh, that get hit. And that's because higher mortgage rates. And I think everywhere else is okay. We've seen that in the data, but also new home sales. New home sales to me is the area that gets impacted. And it's the most crucial area in terms of housing to GDP because it's construction jobs, it's housing starts. What we saw in 2018 when mortgage rates got to uh, 5% is that we saw a spike, a, 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 a recessionary spike in monthly supply of new homes uh, and that basically meant 2019 total housing starts were flat, you know, uh, even though historically they were still low. That is the area to always look at because that's the most important area for housing for the economy. And higher mortgage rates have uh, uh, impacted new home sales always. But again, even new home sales were accelerating the first two months of uh, 2020. So we have to be mindful that what happens in the next 90 days might not happen when people are able to go out and, 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 and kind of walk the earth because demographics for housing is the best right now. You know, a lot of my work is that this housing cycle from 2008 to 2019 would be the weakest ever recorded history because demographics were more favored for renting. Years 2020 to 2024, ages 26 to 32 are the biggest in US history. Your first time home buyer age is 33. So the existing home sale market should do fine, but we should always be mindful of the new home sale market because that is prone to uh, uh, drastic hits when mortgage rates are higher because it's a very small marketplace competing against this massive existing home sale market that are cheaper, uh, 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 cheaper homes, geographically are spread out all over. So the new home sale to me was always something we have to be mindful of for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years because it's at a disadvantage versus the existing home sale market. So Logan, two questions. So 
first of all, what's the total proportion of new home sales on a, on a number of sales basis and also on a dollar basis relative to existing home sales? And second, what's the macroeconomic outlook for new home sales going forward in terms of construction? The best way for me to, to showcase this is that the existing home sales market, uh, the last uh, uh, data line was showing at 5.77 million. And the new home sales market, uh, you know, the last sales was 765,000. Now there's always a one to six uh, a, a model, new home sales versus the existing home sales market. But one of the reasons why new home sales have really uh, underperformed for many years is that this is a much more expensive uh, home. And we've been building bigger and bigger homes uh, really since 1975. But when mortgage rates started to really uh, uh, perk down lower, 1996, if you look at uh, the median square foot of a, 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 of a single family home, or roughly we're at 2000, we got as high as 2700 uh, during this uh, the previous expansion. These are when square you look feet. at that, yeah, square feet. So median uh, square feet. But if you look at the size of families, they've been falling. You know, so the so we've been building bigger and bigger homes for the new home sales market, while family sizes have gotten smaller. So you can see the advantage the existing home sales market, which you know, if you look at housing in ge in general, it's a thirty thirty trillion dollar uh, 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 in industry. That sector always has an advantage over the new home sales sector. So going out for many decades now, the builders have gotten the memo after 2014, I think 2014, when they had this big sales miss, you know, people were looking for 20% sales growth that year, we barely finished a positive working from a very extreme bar. They're trying to provide smaller homes. And I just think it's going to be difficult for them going out for decades because they're always competing against a massive existing home sales market. So whenever you hear economists over the last few years always talk about, well, we have to produce more homes, we have to produce more homes. The key is that the builders never purposely oversupply the market. They're basically always keeping in line to their supply and demand models and their profit margins. So you're never going to see an oversupply new home sales market until the, unless the government comes in and basically you know it starts building on their own. So I think it's that's the thing going out for many decades is that the new home sales market is always going to be at a disadvantage. You know, uh, every decade that we you know we progress on. There's just more and more existing home sales uh, or existing homes out there. So it's difficult for the builders because that's their main competition, right? Uh, uh, and we're not talking about, you know, we, we produced uh, almost uh, 2 million housing starts in the last cycle. So there's homes out there that are just cheaper, smaller, uh, and, and there's more of them in any, any city. And I think that's the difficult part that the builders have to work with. Because new home sales have had this weakest uh, cycle ever recorded in history, they're just working off a lower bar. Uh, and you know, you, uh, that's the advantage the new home sales market has over the existing home sales market is that you know, underperforming for many years, you just have a low bar to work with. You know, another thing that you watch very closely and that you do a lot of charting on is, uh, is employment uh, and employment cycle related uh, information. So what, what's the potential impact or the feed through of a decline in new home constructions? What's the outlook look like and what does it portend more globally from a macroeconomic context? Well, a lack of production uh, uh, definitely means construction jobs go down, big ticket items go down. Uh, now, it, on a historical basis, you know, when you're when you're ha when you have an overheating housing market or an, uh, housing starts above 1.5 million, you're always at risk uh, of production coming down. But except now, we're kind of not we're not we've never oversupplied the market. We're kind of under production. So, if this recession is a few quarters. Uh, you'll see a, uh, a, a production cut maybe for just a few months, and then we just go back to trend because we're not working from any – if you actually adjust it to population, uh, housing starts are still very low. They're not that much higher than what we see uh, after a recession. So housing, because it's underperformed this cycle, won't get as hit as hard as, let's say, you know, the car market. You know, we've had, you know, the best five-year car sales, and now we see – 43% decline year over year. The car sale is more at risk than something like in the in the housing sales um, housing market because new home sales and total housing starts are still relatively low versus the population. So let's talk on something you touched about on a little bit earlier, which was the uh, transmission mechanism between uh, the ten year rate and uh, and mortgage rates. What's the actual how? What is the function of that transmission mechanism? How does it actually work? And what's happened here that's been different from in past cycles? 
what I tell people right now is, you know, I, I did a Twitter live talking about a mortgage market meltdown margin call really early and people kind of didn't understand. And I think for me to uh, tell viewers that mortgage rates should be below 3% right now. If the 10 year yield is below uh, 1%, uh, mortgage backed securities uh, get, uh, uh, actually get some purchasing. Mortgage rates should be under 3%. If you look at the historical average of the 10-year yield from 1981, you know, where mortgage rates were 16, 17, 18%, that chart has gone all the way down. Uh, personally, for myself, recessionary yields are about 62 basis points, a negative 21 on the 10-year yield. So mortgage rates should be a lot lower, but because of the uh, mortgage market meltdown, whatever you want to call it, mortgage rates are still much higher than what they should be. Right. Uh, but rule of thumb is that if the 10 year yield is below 1%, rates should be, mortgage rates should be under 3%. Yeah, I think a lot of people were perplexed about those two moving in the opposite direction. Yeah, and that's just the stress. I mean, just because I work in the industry, I could see that within hours that week of mm. March 9th, there were things that were done that were similar to what I saw in 2008. I remember in 2008, in August, Wells Fargo basically uh, printed 8% uh, mortgage rates. Uh, their rate sheet. And that that's just basically saying we're out of business. We're not doing anything right now. And that's some of the actions that I saw. Now, it's a much different situation this time than it was in 2008. Uh, we don't have a massive wave of defaults about to happen, home prices coming down on over leveraged credit cycle. But you can see the stress happen uh, uh, within hours. And in that by the end of the week, by March 14th, uh, the, the the chaos actually started in the mortgage market, and we're still dealing with it right now. And one thing I always try to emphasize with everyone is that we should be very grateful that Freddie and Fannie were not taken out of conservatorship and publicly traded companies on their own. Because if that was the case, and we ran into this, first of all, those stocks would be pennies right now, and we would have to require the government to take them back in. So the one benefit of all this is that, you know, that process of taking them out of conservatorship did not happen. If that was the case, we'd be talking about a much bigger problems and the government coming back and taking Freddie and Fannie into conservatorship. You know, I know it's 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 an, an imperfect metaphor, but one of the things we often default to with with new crises is comparing this to the 2008, 2009 cycle. Um, you talked a little bit about that if you in a little bit more detail in terms of the durability of the risk and downside that we saw then versus what we see now and the outlook. Here's here's the biggest difference from 2000. Well, I would say from 1996 to 2005, the loan quality was not great. Uh, uh, the cash out boom really accelerated from 2003 to 2006. This cycle has the best home loan profile I've ever seen in my career in 24 years. And our family has been in banking since the late 1950s. We have very high FICO scores uh, uh, as homeowners. There's no exotic debt structures. That's the main thing. That's the biggest difference between this cycle and the previous cycle. The previous cycle was rotted with exotic loan debt structures. That means if you had two people working and those loans uh, uh, recasted, Nobody could afford those homes. Here, we have a lot of nested equity. Nested equity means that people that bought homes from 2010 to 2017 have a lot of equity built in, so they have selling equity. The stress right now goes back to traditional FHA home buyers in 2018 and 2019 because they, you know, these are three and a half percent downs with uh, upfront mortgages added to the balance. They don't have any selling equity, and especially those that got loans uh, with FICO scores below 620. That's the stress market. That is where we can see a job loss recession actually become a legitimate uh, foreclosure down the line. I know the government is going to do whatever it can to keep uh, foreclosures uh, from happening anytime soon, but that's the marketplace that you should see the stress. Outside of that, it, it's been a very clean uh, uh, housing profile in terms of the loan quality, and that, and, and we are going to benefit from that uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, demand coming from legitimate homeowners that do not need what I call non-owning capacity debt to own the house, and that's the big difference between you know 2006 to 2008 to 2018 to 2020. You know, to engage in a little bit of a counterfactual here, it sounds like if we hadn't had this terrible virus, you would be very bullish about the U.S. housing market. It, you know what? For myself, I, I am. All my work was based on years 2020 to 2024 housing getting better, and even for myself, the first two months of 2020 
outperforming. Housing starts up almost 40% year over year. Purchase application at cycle highs. Uh, uh, existing home sales, 13-year highs. So it is not an overheating market. You know, existing home sales were at 7.26 million during the peak of the housing bubble, but it's a little bit stronger than I thought. And, it, and if there was no virus, I'd be writing about, well, home prices are accelerating way too fast right now. Maybe we should look to kind of curtailing credit to kind of stop this from accelerating because the demographics of housing, the bread and butter of the housing market in these next few years has the best demographic patch ever seen in US history and mortgage rates are low. But if mortgage rates ever increased, even four and a half percent to 5%, you've always seen a hit on demand. So there's a little, there's a fine equilibrium to work with. But yeah, the first two months of the year, even for myself, surprised me. You mentioned something earlier about uh, about the impact of mortgage rates uh, on on coastal on coastal regions more so than the rest of the country. Why would that be the case in New York and California? I mean, obviously, it's, it's the same mortgage market. Why is it so much more sensitive here and uh, where you are than everywhere else? You know, it's for example, my neighborhood that I that I live in is in Irvine, California, nine two six zero three. Median home price is one point two million. So whenever you get to these coastal areas, uh, uh, the median sales price is much higher, which means you need uh, uh, bear down payments, which means that mortgage balance is stretched to a degree. So that marginal home buyer is always going to be at risk. Uh, and, and this is something that's for, very odd for people because back in 2013, when I in May, I remember writing about, hey, listen, if mortgage rates going to go up. It's going to impact housing. People started to say, no, your payment's only going to go up, you know, $120. And I said, it, it, it doesn't matter. The marginal home buyer will always be at risk when mortgage rates go up. And it's these coastal areas. Uh, and we saw that. We, I think 2014 is a really good example. 2014 purchase applications were down 20% year over year on trend during the heat months. We really haven't had any kind of negative downtrend with duration. But now we're going to see it mostly due because people aren't going out to buy. But uh, yes, the coastal areas, just because the median sales prices, it's much higher than the Midwest and even in the South. Uh, there's marginal home buyers that simply uh, uh, cannot afford the house. Uh, and th that's where we've always seen the demand hit uh, when mortgage rates are higher. It doesn't mean that the entire uh, total home sale market is going to is going to collapse. But those areas always see the demand hit. Two questions sort of together. And for first is, what's the role of international cash inflows in those in those two markets? And, and what's the impact of international cash inflows? Or rather, what's the impact of the virus to that sort of international buying now? Well, this, uh, this is a great question. A lot of a lot of people always thought that international cash buyers were a, a much bigger portion of the market in general, but in, in definitely in coastal areas. I remember here in Irvine in, in 2013 and 2014, it had like 80% of the new homes were being bought by the Chinese uh, right. here in this in the city. Uh, cash buyers is roughly 250 to 300 thousand. Uh, homes bought per year out of a six million total home sales market. So you, that gives you a rough idea. The Chinese home buyer has fallen uh, last year, actually, to the lowest levels of the cycle. So that cash buyer, but in, in general, cash buyers themselves have been falling. Uh, during the cycle, we've had a record breaking level of cash buyers. 20 to 30 percent of the market in general have been cash buyers, not so much all international, but you see uh, real estate investors buying buying homes to rent them out or buying homes to flip them. Even recently, the, the cash buyers are about 16, 17% of, of all the homes bought for the existing home sales market. That is extremely high still on a historical basis. It That isn't the case for the new home sales market. And that's one of the reasons why new home sales market always gets hit. Uh, with, with higher mortgage rates, because that's roughly a 90 to 93 percent mortgage marketplace. It's not like the existing home sales market that's benefited from 20 to 30 percent cash buyers. And in a low interest rate environment, real estate investors are always going to be there to try to grab deals just to rent out homes, because there's always going to be a portion of the marketplace in general demographics that are always going to be lifetime renters. They're just simply never going to be home buyers. So it'll be interesting to see how the real estate the uh, investor acts in this uh, in the next few months. Do they think they can get deals where they want to put some of that cash into the marketplace? But in general, you're looking at 250 to 300,000 homes that were bought every year in this cycle from international buyers. Russians, Brazilians, Canadians uh, uh, were all part of that process. And definitely we saw the Chinese when capital controls were put in, uh, limit their buyings to cycle lows last year. We should see that again this year. 
you know, while it's relatively small on a unit by unit basis, right, it has to have an outsized impact on a dollar basis. As I wander around here on the Upper East Side, the, the nicest apartments in this neighborhood are empty 50 weeks out of the year because they're bought by international buyers who come into town or just use them purely as investment vehicles. So what's the impact of that? The very, very high end marketplace gets impacted by that. And uh, uh, I mean, I remember when, you know, I was uh, helping my parents sell their house in Nelly Gell Ranch and, you know, it was a two million dollar house and i see chinese buyers coming in this was back in 2016 uh and just you know majority of them were chinese looking in and looking to see if they just wanted to put cash in so the high-end marketplace uh that is where you see the the biggest impact with international money not coming so in, in areas in new york where you have uh relatively relatively to the total marketplace it's 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 small but definitely for sure when, when the cash buyer is drying up, you see those areas where homes are empty. Uh, so it, we should expect that, you know, uh, uh, that in the future, we're not going to have 20 to 30 percent of all home or existing homes being bought with cash. But when the cash international buyer dries up, there's certain marketplaces that you will just see the impact like this. And this is why you're probably seeing that in New York. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen that here in California, especially in, 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 you can see that in Seattle, that some of those markets, some of those high end money is, is not there anymore. You know, you, you mentioned the rental market. One of the things that got really out of whack during the housing, uh, during the uh, great financial crisis, and something that I think layman could follow was in certain in certain uh, areas, uh, for example, uh, Las Vegas, the Inland Empire, you saw these ratios of the pr price of rental to uh, purchase get dramatically skewed. Are we seeing anything that looks like that happening right now? We're seeing some of that skewed marketplace, but I think the thing about you know, when you, when you look at those kind of data lines, we saw an explosion. And, and the best way for me to, to, to explain it, real home prices really went too hot from 2002 to 2005. So you see the, the rent equivalents from 2002 to 2005 really take off. If you look at now, the duration is longer, the trajectory is smaller, but we still have, you know, this, this where the, the, the rent price to home still not to the level to where it was during the housing bubble, but you still see that gap out there. And and the thing about rentals is that we literally do not build enough low rental uh, uh, construction in this in, in in our country. So the rental inflation story will always be there for that marketplace, and that takes uh, you know uh, income capacity away from from uh, low wage renters always. And until we actually massively overbuild in that cycle, which we're still never doing, uh, we're just trying to build as marketplace re uh, rental units as possible. Um, that type of inflation is, is, is hurtful because relatively to their incomes, they're gonna get, they're gonna get impacted always. And in, unless, unless you have 3D printing, just build really cheap uh, uh, homes, uh, the, the rental aspect is just gonna still have that inflationary factor. Okay, and what's the cause of that distortion and what's its impact more broadly on the society and on the market? We're always told that we need to build more homes. And for the last eight years, the housing market never agreed with anyone. It just simply builds off demand. And the multifamily construction, while it has had its best uh, cycle in many, many decades, still is always going to be underbuilt because it's simply too expensive to build rental properties in coastal cities. You know, it's cheap in the Midwest and the South. Rent is cheap, but in these areas where we have a higher uh, wages relatively to home homeowners versus rental uh, uh, capacity people, it's just simply we simply do not supply the marketplace. So that it's very difficult to move up in society when that much of your liability cost is going to your shelter costs. And I think that's something you know after this crisis. We need to really look at how do we produce cheap rentals that the private sector and the public sector can work together because it's very difficult when people say, well, let's just increase wages. Well, OK, that helps, except that landlord is going to get some of that uh, uh, capacity and then raise rents as well. So right. it's a very complicated problem because even if you uh, raise wages on the lower end, it, it, the rent inflation is simply going to eat it because there's not enough supply there. Right. And we see this, especially in the New York market. This is something that's a particularly acute problem here. Yeah. In Los Angeles, you know, 50 uh, percent plus of the working population are dual renters uh, in one household. So you have a lot of roommates 
in, in, in a sense, just because uh, even renting for yourself uh, uh, is too expensive. So you have you know right. a lot of people renting rooms in, in, in homes. Yeah, I mean, New York City is one of the few places where you meet people in their 30s who are doctors, lawyers, and uh, have roommates, right? It's not something Yes, that's yes, and it, it's, the same, it's the same in Los Angeles, even in Orange County, too. Home prices. I think that's, that's where a lot of people have, uh, ha- have asked me questions. Where are home prices going to go? And I think one, one thing that uh, with home prices, real home prices were negative last year on a year-over-year basis, something not a lot of people knew about. And I always thought that is bullish. I mean, wrote about that. The fact that real home prices on the Case-Shiller Index went negative shows that we don't really have an overheating housing market. We just have an expensive one to, for, for certain household incomes. But the fact that um, people are thinking this is a housing bubble, that home prices are going to fall 38 to 65 percent within a very short amount of time. I, I, I 100 percent disagree with that thesis because it was never an overheating demand cycle. It was never an overheating production cycle. It was never uh, overheating a home price cycle on a real home, uh, a, a real, real home prices on a year over year basis. But when supply increases, and I think that's the thing going out for the next few months, a lot of people are taking their homes off the market because they don't want to even try to sell their homes. But because supply might stay here for a little bit more, a little bit longer in terms of homes are going to take longer to sell. You're going to see uh, increases of inventory. Don't think of that as a housing bubble crash uh, about to happen. I think that's that's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen in the last six or seven years. People thinking just because nominal home prices went back to 2006 levels that we are prone to a massive decline. And really, anything that's a bubble means that it has to go back to trend. That means home prices have to go back to 1996 levels, uh, similar to what we saw during the the housing bubble uh, crash. So uh, we don't have that overheating demand cycle, but home prices at some point will fall. It's how do you get there with the inventory? Because the biggest thing in this cycle for housing is housing tenure doubled. What I mean by housing tenure, people from 1981 to 2007 were living in their homes about five years. In this expansion, it's gone to 10 years and going up uh, longer. So why are people doing that? It goes back to uh, one of my original theses years ago that we've been building bigger and bigger homes for decades and family sizes have been getting smaller. So that single family home of 2,000 square foot or 2,100 square foot is acceptable for people that, uh, that have two kids. So unless you're building a massive condo market, a lot of the homes out there are, are fine for, for people. So they're just staying in their homes longer. A lot of people have called the mortgage rate lockdown thesis. This is something the housing industry has created. I am 100% disagree with that thesis. They, they say that Americans are sitting at home with their low mortgage rates, and once it goes lower, inventory is going to be released because people are going to move. I don't believe in that concept. I think people are just sitting in their homes because they don't need to move. You move because of your job. You move because you have more kids. You move because you you want to go to a better school for your children. Uh, if you lost your job or divorce, but people aren't sitting there thinking, you know, I got a 4% mortgage rate. I'm going to, you know, wait till three and a quarter and then pull the trigger. No, I think housing tenure is the story now going out for many, many decades, how long do people stay in their homes? Because if that's the case, production might not ever come back to what people want it to be. You know, you caution against uh, sort of too much focus on absolute nominal dollar values of housing. Other than housing tenure, what other metrics do you look at to get a sense of where we are in the cycle and what the risk factors are going forward? There's Two key data lines that uh, everyone should track is mortgage purchase applications on a year over year basis. You know, when we set that low in 2014, and I mean, we're talking, we're not talking about the lows in 2006 and 2008, adjusting to populations, the lowest level the mortgage purchase application had was in 2014. We've had an uptrend always intact since then. That uptrend is gonna break now. We're gonna see uh, 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 much higher year over year declines. After the virus is over and people walk through, you always want to keep an eye on year-over-year purchase application data from basically the second week of January to the first week of May. And that gives you a good idea because if that comes lower, then inventory levels should increase. And inventory levels for the existing home sale market hasn't really gone anywhere too much, except in 2014, we almost got to six months for one year. So inventory levels and purchase application data, that gives you an idea 
of where the demand and, and especially with home prices and, and, and nominal dollars, where we're going because purchase purchase applications are down and inventory increases, then definitely home prices have to fall because simply it's too expensive for the market. It's going to take longer to sell a house. And then going out in the future, job loss, recession, how much, how many homes are going to be on the market, distress sales, that'll increase the inventory out there. We've never been able to get to six months uh, post-1996 uh, uh, unless we had a job loss recession or a housing bubble crash. This is why it's difficult because people are staying in their homes longer. You know, on a, on a more pragmatic or, or individual level, so if you were unfortunate enough to be someone who listed your house uh, on uh, March 1st, what, you know, we hear all kinds of advice about this, that people say lowering prices isn't good, pulling it off the market isn't good. What's your advice for people who are in that unfortunate position right now? You know, everyone has to have their own game plan of why you're, why are you trying to sell? Okay. So if you're selling to, because you have to move up to a bigger house, then, you know, you can leave your home on the marketplace and see what happens. Because I know a lot of buyers are saying, Hey, listen, I'm not going to get outbid here. So I'm going to go into the market right now. I know a few home buyers that I know just said it was, it's actually refreshing that I wasn't outbidded this time. Um, if you're concerned about price, uh, and you don't need to sell, you, you know, a lot of people have already done this. They've taken their homes off the market. They're just going to go, listen, I can't have an open house. Right. You know, I, I, I'm just, I, the, the process of buying a home has changed completely. And I know everyone is doing these virtual open houses, but it, it, yep. nothing, nothing is, comes close to actually having buyers come in your house and looking at the home. So, uh, for those people that are concerned about price, maybe you take your home off the market wait until lockdown protocols are taken off, give it about 30 days even, and then I would uh, uh, put my home in the market. And that's if you're a price oriented. If you need to sell your home because you have to, because you have to move, then you know you, you got to take your chances uh, in this type of marketplace. Just know that it's just not a functioning economy as long as lockdown protocols are in place. So what else are you looking at right now, Logan? When you look to the future, what are you thinking about, and what are you looking at for uh, for potential uh, for potential events that could move this market? Well, f first of all, the bond market will lead you. It, l it let us down. You know, the ten-year yield uh, 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 started to break much lower before jobless claims uh, uh, started to take off. So, for me personally, the ten-year yield uh, credit. You know, the St. Louis Financial uh, Stress Index was at an all-time low in February, and it has gone parabolic. So if you want to know when the economy, and for, especially for the housing market, will get better, that 10-year yield should be getting above 1.33%. Uh, in fact, the 10-year yield today, you know, 75 basis points, is still too high relatively to the economic damage that we're seeing right now. So the bond market is already telling you, hey, listen, Q4 is going to be better than Q2, which isn't saying much because Q2 is going to be horrific. Keep an eye on it. When the 10-year yield goes up, and yes, that means mortgage rates will go up, that means we're starting to get the process back uh, to where we get back to just a normal economy where people can walk to earth. The St. Louis Financial Stress Index will start to come back down. We saw this in 2008 and jobless claims as parabolic and as horrific that data line has gotten. You know, those three things you want to keep an eye on on jobless claims, the St. Louis Financial Stress Index, and if the 10 year yield heads up higher, it's a good thing. Uh, that means the bond market is looking for uh, a growth to happen again. Right now, we're still so far away from from anything. I kind of look at for my data points is separating this uh, this economy into three different stages: the BC before coronavirus, you know, the AD after the disease, which we're seeing right now. Some of the most horrific economic data we'll ever see in our lifetimes. But there's going to be an AB stage. America is back. And for America to come back, you've got to get lockdown protocols off. You've got to see the bond market, bond yields rise. You've got to see this, uh, credit get a lot better, high yield index, financial stress index come down, and jobless claims comes down. And when that happens, believe in it. Uh, uh, after 2008, when we saw those data lines get better, a lot of people didn't believe in that, missed out on the longest economic expansion ever recorded in history, the longest job expansion ever recorded in history. So those three things are what I'm looking for because I think that benefits the housing market which was looking really good the first two months of 2020. Yeah, you know, it's it's we're outside of the domain of finance and predictability here, and we're into the domain of biology, which none of us are experts in, and is uh, is a bit of a frightening. It impact. is, it, you know, that, that's a really good point. I mean, for myself, virus modeling is just like, you know, uh, boy, this is a brand new world. I mean, for yeah. myself, I've always I've always talked about two dates, May 18th and September 1st. Why? Because before we had even a thousand cases, just looking at other countries that started to do testing and lockdown protocols, I thought. 
once we get to 27,000 cases confirmed six to eight weeks after that, our data should look better. I know in New York, some of the data lines are starting to look a, a, a better, but by May 18th or even before that, the curve should get look a lot better in terms of new cases. And that is the first step because I think the summer heats, June, July, and August, it buys us some time to get ready for the second wave. And then we we can't have this happen over and over again. You know, we can't have this shut, shutting down the economy. You no, know, even if we're putting six to ten trillion dollars uh, uh, disaster relief in this economy, it's simply we we cannot function that way. So. We've got to use that time that summer to prep for the fall and winter so we don't have a reoccurrence where we say, hey, everybody, go back at home. Uh, because, again, that is the biggest risk, as we can see, shutdown protocols are the biggest risk to any kind of economy out there. So, so those summer months are really key for us to prepare for uh, the virus coming back in the fall and winter. When you mentioned governments and government responses, what are you looking at in terms of policy action from the federal government that could ameliorate or potentially dampen the recovery? Send more checks out um, because right now this isn't the the economy is shut off. So basically, you know, the fact that we've enhanced unemployment benefits and we're sending checks out, it'll stabilize this. And, and, and when, when I look at how much money is being thrown out, if you look at people who make forty six thousand dollars and less, if you take weekly unemployment benefits, uh, the average, take about $100 off of that, then you add the $1,200 check to it, you know, they're, they're not going to have what we call depressionary loss in wages because they're going to get some incomes. Send checks out, uh, uh, help fund small businesses, because right now the crisis is what are we going to look like in, in, in four or five months? What? Because some companies just aren't going to make it. Right, no matter how much the SBA loans are, some companies are simply not going to make it. Small business, what, 15 days on cash on hand, you lose 70 to 90% of your revenue, but you're done. So whatever it takes, you throw as much money as you can to keep as people as solvent uh, as possible. And, and even with the $2 trillion fiscal stimulus and the $4 trillion monetary, I would be doing much more to just keep as many people as solvent to get back to the A B stage where people start to walk the earth again, and I think that, I think it, it, it's it's excellent to see that we just went to that route right away, but don't let up. And I expect for more fiscal stimulus and more monetary uh, uh, operations to try to keep as many companies and people as solvent and possible until they can start working again. You know, talking about sending checks from a slightly different angle, what's your thought about uh, loan forbearance, mortgage forbearance, the potential impacts, the potential risks, and also the potential upsides? The main risk that I see right here is that they made it open-ended. So when you make anything open-ended, some people might take that uh, um, advantage when they don't need it, which puts stress into the service market. So hopefully right now, the FHFA and Mark Calabrio and the, the Mnuchin and everybody's trying to think of a way to, to mitigate the damages because you can't just open ended and say nobody, uh, 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 collect, nobody mortgage payments go all the way and rent goes all the way. There's a financial aspect behind that. So uh, I think for every, every American, call your servicer and see what the plan is. Because some people don't realize that some of these plans, you got to lump your payment after, you know, you know, after three months, you got to pay it all at once. Some of these other plans, you know, they, they read every single line of what uh, forbearance is. But if you don't need to do it, my advice is don't take it, right? There's, there's, there's no benefit for you. If you are struggling, you lost your job and you can't pay, then absolutely take advantage of the situation. But if you could keep on making your mortgage payment and your rent, do so, because I, we don't know what the implications are after uh, that process. So uh, it, it's just that when we just made basically an open-ended call that anybody can miss their mortgage payments. And uh, there isn't a efficient process like the loan modifications that were actually terrible back after the uh, financial crisis in 2008. You still had to qualify for it. You still had to show stress. Uh, in some cases, you don't even have to do that. So just be mindful. Nothing is really free. But if you're definitely stressed, if you definitely lost your job, if you definitely have, uh, even if one one if dual household incomes, if one of your uh, if your spouse lost income, you definitely want to look into that and see the best benefits. But make sure to read everything first. I think there's a there's this notion that it's just basically you're free or they tack it back to the loan. It's it's not that simple for every servicer.
Logan, if you have a few more minutes to join us, we'd like to ask you some questions called the intersection. They're a little bit more personal questions about the way you view the world. So Logan, is there one person living or dead who you'd want to interview? And if so, why? Genghis Khan, because <laughs> when you look at it, I mean, my degree was actually in history. If you look at one person that infected the world in terms of velocity, uh, uh, as horrific as Genghis Khan in, in, in the style uh, uh, of his of his leadership, it'd really be interesting to to, to see uh, what he was like personally, because uh, the Mongols were historic in, in 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 every way imaginable when you when you when you look at the history of data. So it would be interesting to see what he was like personally, because you have to be a just a very unique person to do that kind of damage uh, uh, around the world. Anyone living? Personally, this is just for me because I, uh, as always Magic Johnson. Mm. Growing up, you know, I was a basketball player growing up. Uh, I was a high school basketball coach before I got into finance. Uh, I, I, he, he was such an integral um, part of my life just because of his leadership skills. And uh, uh, it, it was a it was a it was a real turning point when I followed Magic and realized that what it meant to be a leader and what it meant to always be positive for the people around you because you know you know when when you take that role and uh, I it would just be wonderful just sitting down and chatting with him and just going over you know all the stuff that he's gone through on, on the basketball front and the personal front. So, are there any books that have changed your outlook on the world, the way that you see your profession, and the way that you see things more broadly? No, <laughs> there's not been any books. I, honestly, I, I, I am such a chart guy that, I, you know, it, the way my mind works is that numbers are more valuable to me than reading words. Numbers are, uh, and I believe this, numbers are the closest thing we have to the handwriting of God. So uh, uh, looking at data in itself is more impactful for me than any book uh, because it tells me the story in a more proficient way where a human being can interpret history or an event w with their own bias. So uh, charts, of course. That's a great answer. So, <laughs> to, so talking of talking of, uh, of, of, of breakthroughs and uh, are there any key successes or experiences in your life that you think of as a tipping point in your career? Really for me, was being a high school basketball coach at age 18. Mm. You know, uh, I, I mean, I was, I was kind of like an old soul, but general leader uh, anyway. And when you get to have a leadership role at such a young age, uh, and I was like the baby of my, of my high school class too. So I'm, I'm literally coaching kids that are, uh, I'm not too much older on. You mm. learn the aspect of of what it means to be a leader and how you need you need to always 24/7 uh, show that kind of uh, uh, class, show that kind of positive attitude, uh, avoid negativity uh, uh, and, and the dark aspects of humanity. And at age 18, and I only did it for five years, uh, having people look up to you uh, uh, that were young y young kids, and then you see them grow up. You realize that every single day you, you you need to have that mindset with yourself. And coaching high school basketball at such a young age taught me that because what you teach kids or what you tell people, it's going to follow you for the rest of your life. And now a lot of my kids are grown up and they have kids of their own. And, you know, just, you know, having them converse, you know, God, you, you're always so positive. And I always remember, you know, you, you always made us try to work hard and be your best. That to me was the tipping point because I learned it at a very young age and you know use that throughout the rest of your life. So, so conversely, have you had any key failures that really made you reappraise or reevaluate your life that set you on a different trajectory? Yes, you know the the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, faith in humanity can be blinding, and uh, uh, back then, you know, just just seeing the greed and what was going on. And you know, not doing enough to try to uh, uh, spread the word was my failure uh, back then. And we didn't have, I, I wasn't even in, in financial blogging, but uh, I, I learned from that 
uh, to always make sure that uh, humans are greedy always, you know, uh, and, and no matter what it is, the history of humanity has shown us that when money is involved and speculation is involved, uh, societies can go to that very quickly. And one of the reasons I wanted to write, uh, 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 be a financial blogger, was to make sure that lending never eases ever again. And in fact, I've always taken that stance and I've written many articles throughout the last 10 years that tight lending is a perpetual myth. There's just, there's nothing, we have no tight lending in America. We have actually still, even today, very liberal lending standards. Because if you facilitate debt and speculation and money, it could turn a society apart like this. And that's what the history of, of the world has shown us, that when money is involved and speculation involves, people jump in. And always, you know, the failure of not reading that uh, in, in terms of getting out there and trying to explain that this is not a good thing uh, haunts me to this day. And that's is why, I've, for the rest of my life, I'm always going to focus on making sure that uh, lending is, is adequate and safe and uh, to go against any single person that tries to facilitate debt speculation for housing, uh, because that is something that is so impactful for, for, for any economy and for any household. And finally, what belief do you hold that is the most controversial opinion in your professional life? That the US economy is the most prolific economy in the history of the world, and uh, that a lot of these takes on the U.S. economy are more ideological based. If you look at the history of data, if you look at the history of demographics, inflation, everything, the U.S. economy has been able to do such wonderful things. Uh, and because the world has made so much progress in the last 200 years, mm -hmm. that if you look at the history of the world and how bad things used to be, how hard things used to be uh, in the days, the U.S. economy and just generally the progress the world has made has been a miracle you know, especially in the last 200 years. So I myself is always to kind of go after the extreme right and left to kind of say, listen, things used to be a lot worse, you know, 100, 200 years ago today. So let's let's put things in perspective. And I, I always get attacked on that front. And I, and I I expect that to be the case to the very last day I live. That's a great note to end on. Thanks for joining us. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.